evening, I'm Judy Woodruff on the News Hour tonight. The gloves are off between President Trump and James Comey. The president trades barbed with the former FBI director following an interview that targets the commander in chief. Then the state of play in Syria after U.S. airstrikes, a debate heats up in Congress over the power to authorize military action. And sounds of the desert. We travel to Mali in West Africa to hear how the music of the Tuareg people helped them endure. We sing about how we have suffered through politics, through racism against us and our ancestors from the desert. We say we are here. Don't forget us. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... Economy for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. Institutions. Cohen Watch, the president's legal team, joined in a federal court hearing involving his personal attorney, Michael Cohen. And Mr. Trump aimed more insults at fired FBI Director James Comey over his scathing new book. Yamish Alcindor begins our coverage. Is Donald Trump unfit to be president? Yes, but not in the way I often hear people talk about it. I don't James Comey led off his media blitz by criticizing President Trump, focusing much of his attack on the president's character. It came during an ABC interview ahead of the Tuesday release of his memoir, A Higher Loyalty. While Comey told ABC he doesn't support impeaching Mr. Trump, Comey pointed to Mr. Trump's reaction to last year's Charlottesville unrest, his past treatment of women, and what Comey said were Mr. Trump's constant lies. Our president must embody respect and adhere to the values that are at the core of this country, the most important being truth. This president is not able to do that. He is morally unfit to be president. In the interview, Comey also opened up about 2016. He said for him, having to handle the Hillary Clinton email investigation was, quote, a no-win situation. I'm here to give you an update. And he explained again why he went out on his own to announce why that probe would not lead to charges. In the process, he described his discomfort with the perception that then Attorney General Loretta Lynch may have been too close to Clinton and her campaign. I decided, as much as I like her, I have to step away from her and show the American people the FBI's work separately. I actually thought, as bad as this will be for me personally, this is my obligation to protect the FBI and the Justice Department. In a statement before ABC's Comey interview aired, Lynch said she never discussed the probe with anyone from the Clinton campaign or the Democratic National Committee. She also said that Comey had ample opportunities to raise concerns with me. He never did. Comey, of course, came to lead a probe into Mr. Trump's campaign in Russia, one that continues today under special counsel Robert Mueller's purview and could eventually lead to legal jeopardy for the president. In a separate sit-down interview with USA Today, Comey said he could not rule out whether President Trump has been compromised by Moscow. It's hard to explain some things without at least leaving your mind open to that being a possibility. I don't know whether that's the business about the activity in a Moscow hotel room or finances or something else. But again, I, I don't want to overstate it. I'm not saying it's likely. I'm saying, to be honest with you, I have to say it's possible. The White House today said President Trump saw pieces of Comey's ABC interview. And Mr. Trump himself today questioned Comey's credibility. He also called the former FBI director, quote, disgruntled, and said Comey and others, quote, committed many crimes. In New York today, the president's legal team was fighting a different battle. His personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, went to court to prevent government investigators from reviewing files seized during an FBI raid on his home and office last week. Cohen's lawyers called the raids, quote, completely unprecedented. At issue, attorney-client privilege and whether the president's protected conversations with Cohen might be revealed. 
Mr. Trump voiced his concerns on Twitter over the weekend, writing, Attorney-client privilege is now a thing of the past. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, which is not connected to the special counsel's ongoing Russia probe, says that any material taken from Cohen will be inspected by a separate filter team to protect privileged information. But the president's new attorney argued that the president himself must be allowed to determine what is covered by privilege. In a letter sent to the judge late Sunday, she wrote that the president is, quote, the only person who is truly motivated to ensure that the privilege is properly invoked and applied. The U.S. attorney said that proposal would set, quote, a dangerous precedent. For his part, Mr. Cohen's own attorney argued in court, that the judge should appoint an independent special master to sort through the files to, quote, ensure the public's confidence in the appearance of fairness. Prosecutors say Cohen is a target of an ongoing criminal investigation, in part because of a $130,000 payment he made to adult film star Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. So she would keep her alleged affair with Donald Trump secret. Daniels and her attorney were in the courtroom today as well. We will look at some of the legal implications of all of this after the news summary. In the day's other news, at least seven inmates died at a prison in South Carolina after a pitched battle that lasted most of the night. One inmate said bodies were, quote, stacked on top of each other. It happened at a maximum security facility in Bishopville, where gang members fought each other with homemade knives. Authorities say most of the dead were stabbed or beaten to death. 17 other prisoners were seriously injured. What we believe from the initial investigation is that this was all about territory. This is about contraband. This is about cell phones and you've heard us talk about these over and over again. These folks are fighting over real money and real territory while they're incarcerated. At least 20 inmates have been killed in South Carolina prison since the start of last year. The head of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Scott Pruitt, faces new questions tonight. The Government Accountability Office reports the EPA illegally spent $43,000 on a soundproof communications booth for Pruitt's use. He's already under fire over first-class air flights and a bargain condo lease linked to an energy lobbyist. Meanwhile, an inspector general reported that Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke could have avoided taking a charter flight last year that cost $12,000. A powerful spring storm moved out of the northeast and mid-Atlantic today after blasting a wide swath of the nation and killing three people. A tornado struck Sunday near Greensboro, North Carolina, and the damage was bad enough to close three schools for months. Mayor Nancy Vaughn says the devastation is sweeping. It really looked like a war zone and we have to remember that people are living in these conditions. Um, today, everybody is grateful just to be alive, as we are grateful that they are alive. They are going to be living under some very difficult conditions for a very long time. To the north, the system dumped two feet of snow in Wisconsin and Minnesota over the weekend and broke records for April snowfall all across the upper Midwest. In China, the widely used microblog site Weibo has reversed its decision to censor gay content after a public backlash. The company that runs Weibo initially said the crackdown was a response to tough cybersecurity laws. Now it says it will mainly focus on removing pornographic and violent material. President Trump moved today to fill two more vacancies on the Federal Reserve Board. The White House said he is nominating Richard Clarida, a professor at Columbia University, to be the Fed's vice chair. Kansas Bank Commissioner Michelle Bowen is the choice to fill a second slot. Both nominations require Senate approval. Wall Street's week is off to a good start. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained nearly 213 points to close at 24,573. The Nasdaq rose 49 points and the S&P 500 added 21. 
And the 2018 Pulitzer Prizes are out, and they are dominated by reporting on sexual misconduct and the Russia investigation. The New Yorker magazine and the New York Times won the Public Service Prize for coverage of the Harvey Weinstein scandal that galvanized the Me Too movement. The Times also won, along with the Washington Post, for investigating Russia's meddling in the 2016 U.S. election. In the arts, rapper Kendrick Lamar's album Damn took the music prize. He is the first non-classical or jazz artist to win a Pulitzer. And Andrew Sean Greer's novel Less won the prize for fiction. Still to come on the news hour, how revelations from the former FBI director affect the ongoing investigation surrounding the president. The situation in Syria following the weekend's airstrikes by Western allies. Inside the musical culture of the Tuareg people of Mali and much more. As we reported earlier, new revelations by former FBI Director James Comey have stirred the president's ire on Twitter. But did they say anything new about the potential legal trouble Mr. Trump could face? For that, we are joined by Chuck Rosenberg, who served as a U.S. attorney and also as a senior FBI official when both Robert Mueller and James Comey served as FBI directors. Chuck Rosenberg, thank you and welcome back to the program. You've now had a chance to read... James Comey's book. What was your overall reaction? Well, I did have a chance to read the book. I read it cover to cover this weekend. Uh, a couple of different reactions. One, it's exceedingly well written. It's a story well told. Uh, two, I don't think there are lots of new revelations in it. And by that, I mean for the legal case that uh, Mueller and his team might be building against the president or others. Um, and then one other thing that I think I should add it's a little bit unusual to have witnesses out there as publicly as Jim Comey is out there now speaking and writing. Uh, normally a prosecutor, and I was one for a long time, uh, would caution a witness against that. But Jim isn't an ordinary witness, and I'm sure the Mueller team already knows his story backwards and forwards. And in fact, I want to ask you about that, Chuck Rosenberg, because there is a fair amount of comment out there about the fact that James Comey not only is making observation in this book and in these number of interviews he's starting to do on television. In fact, we welcome him in an interview on the NewsHour next week. Uh, but he's making what we in, the, in journalism call editorial comments. He's commenting on the president. He thinks he's unfit for office. Um, and, and some pretty strong, strongly negative comments about the president. Uh, what do you make of that? Is that an appropriate thing for the former FBI director to do? Well, it's unusual, Judy. There's no question about that. It's a book and not a legal brief. And so while normally you wouldn't expect an FBI director or a former FBI director to do that, um, I understand it because he's also telling a story. And when you tell a story, uh, for to bring in your reader, you add some color, you add observations. A legal brief wouldn't sell very well. I suspect this book will. And, and in connection with that, there's been real pushback. I mean, the White House is saying this is just an effort to sell his books. Um, uh, the president uh, has used some strong language, called him a slime ball. Um, is, 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 what do you make of this? I mean, he's basically gotten himself into a new war with the president. Yeah, I, th those terms are, are deeply, deeply unfortunate, and I don't think they befit the office of the president. Look, I'll, I'll say this. I've known Jim Comey for 25 years uh, as a friend, as a colleague, as a boss. He has his faults. We all do. Uh, he has flaws. We all do. He can be stubborn. He can be headstrong. He has a healthy ego. Uh, but in 25 years, I have never, and I should repeat, never uh, known Jim to tell uh, anything but the truth. He's a truth teller. Uh, and that's what I see in the book stories I already knew because I lived through them with him and stories that I learned in reading it. But I've never known him to do anything but tell the truth. And I gather from what you're saying, Chuck Rosenberg, that you don't see anything in here and either what he's saying in interviews or in the book that's going to change the trajectory of the Mueller investigation. I really don't. I mean, there's a legal campaign and uh, that will be waged by agents and prosecutors on one side and defense counsel on the other. And then there's a PR campaign uh, and uh, obviously being waged by 
uh, you know, media folks and pundits and analysts and the like. Uh, but if you're looking at the legal campaign, no, I don't think it changes anything. Again, we don't normally want our witnesses out talking publicly. Right. I get that, but I don't think it changes the trajectory of the investigation or the case. All right, different development today in a New York City federal courtroom. Michael Cohen, one of President Trump's personal attorneys, in court, uh, in essence, protesting federal agents coming into his home, into his offices last week, raiding, taking materials. Uh, what was that hearing all about? And can you explain to us what the judge's ruling decision was afterwards? I, I hope so. Um, so essentially, the Cohen team wanted to stop the prosecutors and the investigators from reviewing anything that was taken from his office. Uh, the prosecutors had set up a system, we always do, uh, where a privilege review team would look first at the stuff and decide whether or not um, it is attorney-client privileged. If it isn't, then they can essentially throw it over the transom to the investigative team. Uh, Mr. Cohn and his attorneys asked the judge to stop the process, and Judge Wood said she would not. She's going to let the process continue. The judge did say, however, that we have to think about how it's going to look going forward whether or not she's just going to let the prosecutors and their privilege review team do the work, whether she'll appoint a special master, somebody um, beholden to the court to do that work, to be determined on the process and the details. But essentially, Mr. Cohen's team lost. Uh, the case will proceed, and the review of the privilege documents will take place in some fashion. Well, a lot of eyes on uh, that set of procedures. Chuck Rosenberg, thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. It's a privilege. And now to Syria and the aftermath of the airstrikes launched by the U.S., the United Kingdom, and France to punish the Syrian regime's alleged use of chemical weapons. As Lisa Desjardins reports, the military strikes have renewed questions about presidential war-making powers. Pentagon video shows the hail of missiles streaking towards Syria on Friday night. Their reported targets, three chemical research and production facilities in Damascus and homes. Satellite pictures displayed the sites hit, here before the launch and then after they were leveled. At an unrelated event in Florida today, President Donald Trump described the strike as a success. They didn't shoot one. You know, you heard, oh, they shot 40 down. Then they shot 15 down. They watched. Then I called. I said, did they? No, sir. Every single one hit its target. Think of that. How genius. <laughs> Not one was shot. Meanwhile, a fact-finding team from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons arrived in Damascus over the weekend. It's on a mission to determine the chemical used in this month's attack on the suburb of Douma that left dozens dead. But as of today, the team said Syria and Russia were blocking them from entering the area. The OPCW called an emergency meeting at The Hague today, and Britain's ambassador to the Netherlands called on the Syrian government and its Russian backers to give the inspectors the access they need. Now, we are obviously keen to make sure that the inspectors uh, have every means that they can to carry out their job and carry out their investigation as soon as possible. And we see no reason why they should not be able to get to Duma. The U.S. representative to the inspectors group said there are indications that Russian teams went into Duma already. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov told the BBC there was no evidence of chemical weapons in Duma and denied suggestions that Russia had tampered with the site. There is no proof that on the 7th of April, chemical weapons were used in Duma. And frankly speaking, uh, all the evidence which they quoted was based on the media reports and on social networks. Order! But in the House of Commons, British Prime Minister Theresa May said Russia was covering up the attack. This as Washington apparently prepared to fire another economic salvo at Moscow. UN Ambassador Nikki Haley spoke Sunday of new sanctions on Russian firms the U.S. believes helped Syria's chemical weapons program. But the Washington Post reported this afternoon that Mr. Trump was not yet ready to impose those sanctions and had ordered a delay. The airstrikes came weeks after President Trump said he wants the U.S. military out of Syria entirely. 
French President Emmanuel Macron said yesterday that he'd convinced President Trump to maintain a presence in Syria, but he walked back those comments today. I didn't indicate any change yesterday. I never said that either the United States or France would stay engaged militarily in the long term in Syria. White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders said today the president still wants to bring troops home from Syria, but there's no timeline yet for their exit. President Trump's actions last week were not specifically approved by Congress. There was no authorization to use military force. In the past few minutes, a group of leading bipartisan senators have unveiled a bill to rewrite current authorizations to use force in Iraq and against ISIS. For more of the question of the president's authority, I'm joined by one of that bill's co-sponsor, Senator Chris Coons of Delaware. He also sits on the Senate Foreign Relations and Judiciary Committees. Thank you, Senator. Thank now, you, looking over the outline of your bill, it does not deal specifically with Syria, but instead with the fight against terrorism and Iraq. I want to ask you about the airstrikes against Syria. Do you believe the president had the authority? Were those lawful airstrikes last week? Well, this is a gray area, Lisa, and one of the reasons that I've engaged in moving forward with this bipartisan bill that Senators Corker and Kane are leading uh, is to try and reassert some of Congress's authority and responsibility in the taking of military action. It's been now 17 years since the 9-11 strikes that led to the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. Uh, and I think those initial authorizations from 2001 and 2002 uh, against uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, against uh, Taliban and Al Qaeda, have been so extended and so overused by both the Bush and Obama administrations uh, that today they are no longer timely and relevant. And so it's long past due time for the United States Congress to step up and take our role in crafting an AOMF that fits our current situation. It is not clear to me that President Trump has a plan for our path forward in Syria or that these strikes were appropriately authorized. And we should mention that we did reach out to the White House to invite them or someone from the White House to appear on this program. They did not supply anyone, but we do hope to have that voice on the show sometime soon. Obviously, this is something you've been working on a long time, Senator. I've heard you on the floor. I've seen you in here and talk about this a long time. And I know that you want Congress to ring in here. But can we talk about the balance of power more globally? Why has Congress, it seems, almost given full power to the president? In, in essence, has the Congress no longer any say, essentially, and let presidents do what they want with the military? Well, this has been a long time coming. Um, since the 1970s, uh, in military action after military action, president after president uh, has done more and more uh, to skirt around Congress's role, and Congress has not reasserted itself. Uh, in 2001 and 2002, Congress stepped up uh, and passed authorizations that were specific to the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. But since then, we have not acted. Uh, late in, Obama, in President Obama's administration, I worked uh, to try and persuade White House counsel uh, and the president to work with the then Democratic majority uh, in the Senate uh, to try and replace the 2001 AUMF, but was unsuccessful. Senator Kane has really led these efforts in the Democratic caucus, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have a robust debate and a vote in the Foreign Relations Committee in the weeks ahead. I think we owe no less uh, to the men and women of our armed forces who are currently carrying out missions around the world, and I think we owe it to the American people to be clear about what role Congress is going to take and for us to take some responsibility, uh, which we frankly uh, have allowed to slip from our grasp over the many years since uh, the 2001 beginning of the global war on terror. Senator, this conversation often centers around the Middle East, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, but you spend a lot of time in Africa. You know that the United States has troops and, in fact, deploys drones, is involved in military action in dozens of countries around the world. Where is the line? Should, for instance, drone strikes be something that Congress approves briefly? Well, I think this is exactly why we need to have this debate, uh, is because last year when four American soldiers tragically were lost on line of duty in Niger in West Africa, uh, I think there were many Americans and many senators who were unaware uh, that there were Americans uh, engaged in a train and equip mission in West Africa. Um, there are members of the Intelligence Committee, the Armed Services Committee, uh, who do stay up to date on this, and I do as well on foreign relations, uh, but there's many others uh, who don't. 
So I think it's long past time for us to debate where we are engaging in military conduct and of what kind. And Senator, briefly, you've also proposed a bill to limit the president's ability to fire special counsel Mueller on a different topic, yes. the Russia investigation. What is your concern there? Uh, well, uh, Republican Senator Tom Tillis and uh, Lindsey Graham joined with Democratic Senator Cory Booker and me in introducing a bipartisan bill. Uh, we are hopeful it's going to get marked up next week in the Judiciary Committee. Um, I think given the ways that uh, President Trump has been tweeting um, more and more aggressively uh, challenging Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation. It's no longer a question of if but when. He will take some action to try and restrict or end that investigation, whether by firing Rod Rosenstein uh, or by directly trying to interfere with the investigation. Current Justice Department regulations prohibit that, uh, but I'm concerned, given very recent developments, that the president may act abruptly. Senior Republican senators have said publicly uh, that that would be the end of the Trump presidency, and I'm looking to find a vehicle to allow Republicans and Democrats to work together to make it just a bit harder for the president to act in an abrupt and inappropriate way. This bill would allow the special counsel, if fired, <laughs> to go to a three-judge panel and will allow them to determine that if he was fired inappropriately, he would, allow to, he would be allowed to resume the investigation. Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, thank you. Thank you. Now we turn to Mali, the West African nation that is home to over half a million Tuareg people. They are an ethnic group that has controlled the trade routes in the Sahara Desert that spans northern Mali for almost 2,000 years. But the Tuareg have never enjoyed significant political power, channeling their frustrations into a rich musical culture. Special correspondent Monica Villamizar went for a listen. Ahmed Kaidi says that the Tuareg people have always been warriors, but he traded his rifle for a guitar. It's a music of resistance. It's poetry for a people that have plenty of things to say. We sing about how we have suffered through politics, through racism against us, and our ancestors from the desert. We say we are here. Don't forget us. The 42-year-old Tuareg spent the first half of his life as a soldier for Libya's infamous dictator, Muammar Gaddafi. Thousands of Tuareg, like Kaidi, were paid to uproot themselves, move to Libya, and fight for Africa's outspoken ruler. But after Gaddafi was killed in 2011, during the early days of the Arab Spring, nearly 30,000 Tuareg made the journey south, from Libya back to Mali. Ahmed Kaidi says the Tuareg are the masters of the Sahara, navigating the dunes only by following the stars, surviving in one of Earth's most inhospitable places. And their music reflects this experience of traveling the desert. It follows the rhythm of the camels walking. You are alone with the camels, and you hum to the rhythm of the camel. It's like a trance that helps you make the long journey ahead. And you are alone, no one to talk to. Tuareg culture became known in the West thanks to music and the so-called Tuareg blues. Every year, groups gathered in a desert festival outside the fabled city of Timbuktu. Even Western singers like U2's Bono flocked there. But for the last five years, the festival has been canceled after violence ripped through northern Mali. 
By January 2012, a Tuareg militia began to fight for independence from Mali and its own Tuareg nation. Guns from Libya fueled a revolution led by Bilal Agsharif. But Al-Qaeda used those same guns and hijacked the revolution. All of Mali became a battleground. Then French troops landed to stop the Islamists in 2013. And UN peacekeepers soon followed. A ceasefire with the Tuareg was finally signed. So Bilal al-Sharif doesn't feel safe here in his own country. Under the peace accords, the UN troops or the Malian army must protect him. But he doesn't trust them fully, and his security and bodyguards are Tuareg. Hi, Mr. Bilal. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? you? Very yeah, nice to meet you. Before 100 years, the Tuareg controlled their areas before colonial period, and they are the masters of their, of their countries. But the situation changed totally. This is why there is always revolutions and resistance. So I think today, uh, we hope in 100 years, we will have never Tuareg who is thinking again as the second uh, class in their countries. Ag Sharif says the majority of his people still dream of a Tuareg state. But not all leaders agree. Fahad al-Mahmoud blames the Tuareg rebellion for unleashing the chaos that turned northern Mali into a conflict zone. The rebellion, the rebellion that started in 2012 really hurt the Tuareg. Today, terrorist groups are the masters of the territory. We are dominated by outsiders in our own land. Ag Sharif would like to incorporate Tuareg fighters into the Malian army to help remove al-Qaeda and ISIS from the north. Many Tuareg have fled the violent Sahara, abandoning their nomadic way of life. There aren't any tourists joining the camel caravans or visiting the bustling markets of Timbuktu. What is 600 miles south is the capital, where many are trying to relocate and to build a new life. Bamako, the capital of Mali, is a world away for the Tuareg people. There is a river and it's humid, and they are desert people, so for them, the life here is completely different to what they're used to. Fadimata Wallet is getting her ancient instruments ready. Her mostly female group, named Tartit, makes the instruments they play. The band had been touring constantly, even performing internationally. But times are tough. Since the rebellion and the war in 2012, we don't go on tour. I don't know if it's because it's a traditional music only liked by older people or if it's because of the crisis. To make ends meet, Fadimata's band plays at weddings and also divorces. Tuareg culture is matriarchal, so when a woman divorces, it's cause for celebration. Even if I'm physically here, my mind and soul are in the desert. I always need to live and think of going back to the desert. If I'm in New York or Washington, I think of my native village in the middle of the desert, sitting on a large sand dune. There I am in peace. No phones or anything. I sleep perfectly well there. Fatimata says she remembers the days when the lyrics to Tuareg music worked like a newspaper. And people learned about current events through song. Our culture has a tendency to disappear. That's why I formed this group of women who spread their message around the world. Today, Fadimata and her band play to only our camera, as the Niger River bears witness. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Monica Villamizar in Bamako, Mali.
Last week, two African-American men were arrested in a downtown Philadelphia Starbucks. Amna Nawaz looks at how the Seattle-based coffee chain is struggling to address the resulting outcry on social media and elsewhere. And that outcry built to a crowd of protesters at that particular Starbucks today, unmoved by CEO Kevin Johnson's apologies and call for unconscious bias training for employees. All this after video of last Thursday's incident went viral. The clip shows police officers confronting two black men seated inside the Starbucks as they wait for a third guest. The store manager reportedly called police after the men asked to use the bathroom without buying anything first. Minutes of calm conversation follow. Police officers eventually handcuff both men and force them to leave. A Starbucks Kevin Johnson today called the arrests reprehensible, apologized to the men, and vowed to make sure this does not happen again. For more on this, I'm joined by Philadelphia City Councilman Kenyatta Johnson, who represents the district in which this Starbucks is located. Councilman Johnson, thank you for your time and welcome. I want to begin by asking you now, since you have met with a number of people involved in this incident, why do you believe that it ended up in this way? Well, you know, first and foremost, um, being the council person in the second councilmanic district, which is a very diverse district, uh, but we also represent the Starbucks in my district, uh, I want to make sure as a council person that no form of racial bias or racial profiling um, is accepted. And so um, we called a press conference today to address this issue and to denounce the recent arrest of the two African-American young men um, who were arrested after waiting while being black in the Starbucks cafe. And as we move forward, we want to make sure that Starbucks have come up with a plan to specifically address the issue of um, diversity and inclusion, as well as um, addressing the issue of racial awareness when it comes to how their business operates. Uh, Councilman, you've now spoken to a number of people involved. You've seen a lot more than most of us who've only seen the video. Yes. Do you believe that these men were the victims of racial bias? Yes. You know, everyone knows that Starbucks brand is you can come there, use their Wi-Fi, and in that environment, you know, have meetings, you know, and, and take a moment and take care of your day-to-day -day business while you're inside their particular store. That's always been a part of their brand. In this particular case, you have two African-American young men. Um, they're not dressed in suits. They're in Rittenhouse Square, which is a um, high-income area in Center City, Philadelphia, and the person who actually called the police, I believe, overreacted uh, when she had the interaction with these young men who said they were waiting for someone to come and meet with them, and that resulted in her calling the cops, which resulted in an unnecessary arrest of the two African-American young men. And so a lot of people in my district are in outrage. A lot of people in my district want answers. But most importantly, they want to make sure we continue to hold Starbucks accountable. Well, let me ask you about that now. The first reaction from Starbucks was a rather tepid apology. The backlash grew. There was then a more robust statement followed by a video statement from the CEO, Kevin Johnson, in which he said this. These two gentlemen did not deserve what happened. And we are accountable. I am accountable. Now, going through this, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure it is fixed and never happens again. Whether that is changes to the policy and the practice, additional store manager training, including training around unconscious bias, and we will address this. Councilman Johnson, are you satisfied with Starbucks response? Not at all. You know, listen, I've worked with several major corporations in a variety of different aspects regarding um, organizing for um, wages for, for low-income individuals, and I know how this game works. We need to see more than just lip service. We need an action plan that specifically goes toward racial sensitive training, but also a campaign to let the people here in the city of Philadelphia know that anyone is welcome to come to the Starbucks Cafe without, being, without fearing any type of racial or social bias perspective when it comes to individuals hanging out or coming to frequent and patronize their business. It's totally unacceptable. Um, again, people are in outrage, and we have to continue to make sure 
that they aren't just giving an apology. We want an action plan to actually address this issue. You mentioned that the manager who had originally first called the police to the scene, uh, she's now reportedly been removed from the store pending an investigation. Is that the standard to which you as councilmen withhold other businesses in your district, that they should remove employees who exhibit any kind of racial bias? Uh, absolutely. I would go even further to say um, if the evidence shows that they ha has exhibited some level of racial bias, they shouldn't be, they should be fired, to be quite frank with you, because at the end of the day, Nobody should feel, in, in, in the year 2018, any form of racial discrimination, regardless of their background, regardless of their lifestyle, and most importantly, regardless of their race. And so and this is totally unacceptable, and Starbucks must be held accountable. And beyond just issuing an apology, beyond just removing the young lady, we need to have an action plan to make sure there's racial sensitivity training for the employees, we need to also make sure that the people of Philadelphia know from a racial awareness campaign from Starbucks that anyone could come to Starbucks and feel welcome without the feeling that they will be kicked out based upon their race, creed, or color. Philadelphia City Councilman Kenyatta Johnson, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me here today. President Trump might be in Florida this week, but the political drama resonated today from Washington to New York and beyond. Here to discuss all that, it's time for Politics Monday with Tamara Keith of NPR and Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report. Welcome to you both, Politics Monday. So, Tamara, I don't know if you call it political drama or something else, but James Comey, the former FBI director, is making quite a tour after his book came out a few days ago. What do you make of the early the reading and the talking. <laughs> so uh, I think that what stands out, especially from the interview last night that he did, which was a, a, an hour-long special on ABC and the interviews that have been following and the reaction to it, is that this is the James Comey that everyone remembers. This is, uh, this is someone who uh, Democrats are still very mad about what he did in the lead-up to the election. Republicans are still don't like him, and they aren't going to like what he's saying about President Trump. Uh, and and it's he he is this remarkably polarizing figure who um, sort of puts himself at the center of it and 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 says that he is doing thing that he made these decisions all out of the same sense of, of principle and, and higher purpose. Um, but. Wow, we are just like right back in 2016, 2017 all over again. Yeah, it is. It's like we cannot let the 2016 election go. As much of that interview was a rehash yes. of, of the 2016 campaign and decisions made during that campaign. So it just feels, yes, that there was a little bit of like, oh, gosh, we can never get this out of our system. The other piece is there wasn't really anything new in here, right? Yeah. You didn't see or hear anything from these interviews or from any of the excerpts from this book that suggests that there's a new piece of evidence that he held back in talking about publicly or that, and I think this is very important, that he could say uh, definitively that there's something illegal that the president right. has done that would put him in jeopardy. He also, of course, went on to say, I don't think he should be impeached. Right. Uh, so I think if there's anything that was new, it might have been that. He expressed some strong views about Absolutely. the president, said he's Very unfit strong. for office, but, but you're right, nothing new. We interviewed uh, Chuck Rosenberg a little bit earlier in the program, who's worked for James Comey. He said, uh, I don't think this changes the Mueller investigation. No. Uh, in any way. In connection, though, Tam, with the Mueller investigation, today in federal courtroom, New York City, one of the president's lawyers, Michael Cohen, was there to try to pull back some of that material that, that uh, federal agents raided his offices to take uh, last week. Um, a lot of eyes were on that courtroom because Stormy Daniels, the uh, uh, porn adult film star, was there in the courtroom with her lawyer. But are we, where are we in that? Uh, yeah. whole drama. It is drama. It feels like law and order presidential unit or something. It is it, it is very much a dramatic scene. You had also the, a lawyer representing the president of the United States arguing that because of attorney-client privilege, he should be able to get a first bite at the apple on all of this evidence. Uh, my understanding is that the judge was not receptive to that argument. You also then find out that Michael Cohen, uh, he had to name who his clients were. Uh, he says that he has three clients, 
One is the president. One was this big GOP donor who had to withdraw from being on the finance committee. And the other is Sean Hannity, the Fox News personality who has since tweeted saying, well, I never paid Cohen anything. Uh, it is it is perplexing. Um, and and if what Hannity is saying is true, that actually helps the government's case because the government is arguing uh, that Cohen didn't really function as an attorney and thus shouldn't have attorney-client privilege. Well, and or the, the, these were the three people whose papers were taken, who the documents were taken that related to conversations. That's right. And so now there's a debate over who... Is he a client or is he just somebody who talked on the phone and right. had conversations with Michael Cohen, what's privileged and what's not? But it does, it feels like a reality show and that if the writers had told you that coming out of this court date with Michael Cohen was going to be the revelation that he is... Um, advising one of the strongest supporters of the president who goes on television with a show that is right. very supportive of the president. I mean, in some ways, I guess it's not shocking, but it really was shocking of, of all the people to say, this is my secret It client. was. It qualified as a surprise. It absolutely it qualified the as a surprise. The big reveal in this episode was kind of a surprise. All right, here's a U-turn. A couple of polls have come out. Can't go too many weeks without talking about no. polls. Showing, uh, Tam, greater enthusiasm this year to see Democrats elected uh, than Republicans. Of course, a poll is always a snapshot. We always say that. Uh, but it does. it is part of a trend we're seeing this year. Yeah, and and Democrats, they, they are, in some ways, Democratic voters. It doesn't matter who the candidate will be. They are going to the polls in November to make a statement about President Trump. Whereas Republican voters, um, President Trump has to convince them to go to the polls to make a statement in support of him. Um, otherwise, they're trying to get them to talk about, to be excited about the tax legislation, trying to get voters mm -hmm. excited about the economy, which is chugging along. Um, but for Democrats, it's pretty simple. It's a protest. Yeah, this has always been a challenge for Democrats in an off-year election because Republicans, just the kind of voters who identify as Republicans, a little bit older, uh, more white voters, turn out to vote in midterm elections. The more diverse electorate, younger electorate, they vote in a presidential election. Right. So Democrats are always trying to get those younger voters or their base voters to come out in a midterm. What's happening now, Tam's exactly right, they're coming out, that base is coming out at at a rate that d Republicans haven't seen in quite some time. So it's not even that haven't Republicans faced. don't, they haven't faced that. Right. So it's not even that Republicans aren't going to turn out to vote. They absolutely can turn out to vote, but that may not be enough because more Democrats are going to turn out than traditionally do in a midterm year. And then we have to wait and see what independents start to do. They have been sour on the president now pretty much universally from mm -hmm. the beginning of his presidency. Is that going to translate into votes in the election? We would suggest yes. And in all these special elections and the midterm elections we've had thus far, the off-year elections, this Democratic enthusiasm has, has shown up by about eight points. Well, we only have seven more months to analyze To analyze all this. each and every one of <laughs> and those. And we'll have to do it every day, all day long. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. All right. Amy Walter, Tamara Keith, thank you both. You're welcome. As we reported earlier, recipients of the Pulitzer Prize were announced today, and they included winners in literature, music, and the arts. Jeffrey Brown is with us from Boston to run through some of them. Hi, Jeff. So, Hi, Judy. the winner in music, a big surprise, Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, that, that is a real big surprise, Judy. As, as you know, the Pulitzer Prize in music almost always has gone to someone in the world of contemporary classical music. Twice it has gone to uh, some of some jazz greats, but that didn't even happen till 1997. The first was Wynton Marcellus, and then in 2007 was the great Ornette Coleman. But here we have Kendrick Lamar from the world of popular music, for one, and even more rap music, which has never happened before. So it, it's quite interesting. There's no question about his bona fides as one of the great wordsmiths and and musicians of popular music today, but it's very interesting to think about the values of music and what is being uh, honored by something like the Pulitzer. It's quite new. 
course, it happened. Uh, one analogy we could think of is Bob Dylan winning the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. Quite controversial. He was getting it in the he was getting the prize for literature as a poet, uh, uh, but here he was a musician and folk singer. Kendrick Lamar is certainly a musician, certainly doing music. But this is quite new for the Pulitzers. Well, I confess I'm a fan of Kendrick Lamar, so uh, so good for him. Now, Jeff, there were some other interesting winners, writers, uh, other categories of the Pulitzer Prize. Tell us about a couple of those. Yeah, I can tell you about a few of them. The, the winner in poetry was Frank B. Dart. Frank is a uh, very renowned uh, elder statesman at this point. He and he won for his. Uh, it's called Half Light, and it's collected poems. And so this is clearly. Um, Honoring him for many decades of wonderful work. He's best known for his uh, dramatic monologues, uh, longer poems in which he sort of uh, uses a dramatic character, sometimes a real character, and puts it into poetic form. Uh, the winner in nonfiction, uh, some of our News Hour viewers will remember because I interviewed him, James Foreman Jr. It's for Locking Up Our Own, it's about crime and punishment. In America, and very timely look at uh, many kinds of issues, particularly around race invo involving the criminal justice system. And in the world of biography, this one interested me. The book is called Prairie Fires. The winner is Caroline Fraser. It's a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Right. And this is the Little Home on the Prairie book. So a lot of people have read these books. Uh, I've been reading it myself, quite interesting. It's framing Laura Ingalls Wilder. But in a much larger picture about the settlement of the American West, of course, the prairie and the pioneers on the prairie. Thank you very much. A reminder that these Pulitzers extend beyond journalism to so many areas of our culture and our life. Jeffrey Brown, thank you. Thanks, Judy. Meantime, Hollywood writer Nell Scoville talks about the culture of harassment that has plagued her industry. Tonight, she shares her humble opinion on why it is still so hard for women to speak out. Oh yeah, me too. Recently, I shared my story about being sexually assaulted by a boss when I was just starting my career as a TV comedy writer. I was in my 20s, he was in his 40s. Now I'm in my 50s. Three decades later, going public has stirred up a lot of fresh emotion. But when a friend recently asked me, aren't you happy about the Me Too movement? I was thrown. Happy? Of course, I feel relief and satisfaction that women who can are raising our voices and naming names. But happiness doesn't really factor into this. With all the toppling of famous directors, actors, and anchors, you may think it's become easier to speak out about this. Nope. Hollywood is still a place where if a powerful person behaves inappropriately and you call them on it, you run the risk of paying the price. Which reminds me of an old Jewish joke. There's a terrible pogrom in the shtetl. All the villagers are rounded up by the Cossacks and lined up against a wall for the firing squad. The rifles are raised and the head Cossack says, before we open fire, does anyone have any last requests? One of the villagers raises his hand timidly and says, as a matter of fact, I do. His neighbor leans over and whispers, shh, don't make trouble. We're conditioned to see the world through the eyes of the people in power, even when our backs are up against a wall. By standing up for ourselves, somehow we get branded as the troublemakers. Shh, we're not. Writer Zoran Neal Hurston observed, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. As difficult and as awkward as speaking out can be, those who can should. It's our responsibility to so many who must remain silent. And I don't agree with people who say that it's time for male colleagues to shut up and listen. Just the opposite. We need men to add their voices to ours. They can also help by sharing salary information and telling us about job opportunities. They can hire women and promote them. And the next time a woman makes a request and someone whispers, shh, don't make trouble, I hope she tells them, I'm not making trouble, I'm making progress. Hollywood writer Nell Scoville. And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Thank you, and we'll see you soon.
Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by Babbel, a language program that teaches real-life conversations in a new language, such as Spanish, French, German, Italian, and more. Babbel's 10 to 15 minute lessons are available as an app or online. More information on Babbel.com. BNSF Railway. Consumer Cellular. Financial Services Firm. Raymond James. And by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Supporting science, technology, and improved economic performance and financial literacy in the 21st century. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. You're watching PBS.